Within forestry, there's widespread speculation that wildlife will not return to planted forests, especially those planted homogeneously years ago, or more precisely, a monoculture. Grandview Woods North in Kitchener, just southwest of the Highway 7 bridge, heading north, you pass a floodplain, which in the summer is filled with great mullein and wild grasses, but in the winter looks pretty barren. The area just behind this plain is a planted eastern white pine monoculture. Imagine a farmer planted a cash crop of pine and that's what it looks like. Rows upon rows of formulaically spaced trees in perfect density. About nine trees per plot, or rather one two hundredth of a hectare. Just south of this reforested area stands another, more natural monoculture of eastern hemlock in Grandview Wood South. The eastern hemlock was made famous in the literary world as a traditional tea used in lieu of black tea by the late author of Walden Pond, Henry David Thoreau. I set out to learn if wildlife were thriving in this 20-odd-year-old pine monoculture with my dog Blue and to see if the wildlife traveled in between the adjoining hemlock forest to the south. The forest floor is covered with tracks embedded in old dried snow. In five hours I didn't come across a single boot print but rather a large number of paw and hoof prints, which I used as not only a guide, but footing so that I wouldn't fall through the thick snow. Just days before, I saw a lone coyote in the area. I went to the spot I had seen it last, but there was no sign of it. They're rather light. It's been windy and a fair bit of melt has taken place over the past couple of days. Those prints are gone. Into the pine bush a little ways from the river, Blue got onto the trail of something and led me up a bank to a ridge just above the planted forest. I saw a herd of deer, more deer together than I've ever seen before in Ontario. In total, there were around 15. We tracked them a little more, but they took off. Blue being a dog with a very high prey drive, she lets out high-pitched yelps when she sees something, and as we were downwind, they noticed us and disappeared into a bog in between the two forests. By this time, I was totally off course, so decided to backpedal up onto the ridge, where I could get my bearing. On our way, Blue picked up another trail, but began acting differently, as if she was scared and refused to go forward. She's still young and unsure about larger animals. Moving forward, we came across a full-out coyote lair, about five square meters of obvious bedding made by a number of coyotes. Shed fur can be seen here. Blue picked something up off the ground. I knew for sure we had just walked into the coyote cupboard. Feeling a little uneasy about it all, we backed up out of there. Coyotes very rarely attack humans, but seeing as it's spring and the mothers are currently carrying, and that Blue was about to eat their leftovers, I thought it would be a good idea to go. Moving further south, we came into the natural hemlock section of Grandview Woods and surprisingly saw the herd of deer once again, situated just about 50 meters up from the coyote's lair. The deer quickly ran off one after another, but we had a chance to see where they had stayed and how amazingly close to the coyotes they were. Walking further south brought us back to the edge of Deer Ridge Golf Course, where we took the green back to the road. In the end, it looks like a healthy population of deer inhabit this reforested monoculture, just as they inhabit the natural monoculture to the south. Or, perhaps, those deer were just pushed to the edge of the hemlock forest by the coyotes that inhabit it. This remains to be seen. But one thing is for sure, in that small area of Grandview Woods flanked by a river, a suburb, a golf course and a highway, there's a very strong wildlife dichotomy living in harmony. They